Is that it? There we go. Sorry, I turned it off. If you will take with me your copy of God's Word and turn to the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah. In the Old Testament, if you're using one of the black hardback Bibles, you can find in the seat in front of you. We're going to go to Isaiah 50, and that's on page 611. Isaiah 50 on page 611. We're in the latter part of Isaiah. Isaiah 50, looking at verses 4 to the end of the chapter, verse 11. Isaiah 50, verse 4. It is written, well, before I read, I forgot to make a note. If you'll notice as you just glance down at your, the scripture, you'll see the word God in all capitals. Usually we find the word Lord that way. That is God's proper name, Yahweh, uh, that he gave and revealed to his people, his personal name. And the word Lord there is the normal word for Lord in lower caps is Adonai. It means master or Lord. So I'll be reading it as we, will we see those words, God, and later in verses 10 and 11, Lord, as God's personal name, as it is written, Yahweh. Isaiah 50, verse 4, it is written, The Lord Yahweh has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with the word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord Yahweh has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord Yahweh helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord Yahweh helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears Yahweh and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of Yahweh and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire and by the torches that you have kindled. This you have from my hand you shall lie down in torment. This is the word of the Lord. Let's ask for his help as we attend to his word. Please pray with me. Quick to listen, Father. Slow to speak and slow to anger. That is how you've called us to hear your word and to listen to you. Quiet, humble, eager, hearing what you have said. Father, we rejoice that this is the perfect posture and life of your son Jesus, and that in him, all of us who have hearing problems to our God are justified and righteous. And in him, by your spirit, we might have new ears and new hearts to hear you and receive your word. Help us, Father, tonight to do so. Give us your grace to hear the word that is spoken, explaining the word you have written. Our Father, we pray that you would give us such hearts and ears of faith, eager to hear from you this evening. We pray for the one who expounds your word, that you would be with him, keep him faithful and careful and clear, that the preaching of your word would be your word to your church. We ask this, Father, for your glory for the good of your people in Christ Jesus. Amen. If you've read the Bible at all, you know that darkness is a common metaphor used in the Bible for life, for the world. It's a good description for our world. I'm sure we could all agree it often describes the confusion and the sorrow and the grief that we all feel when we just try to make sense of life and make sense of things as they are. 
whether it's the tragedies that happen all around us to the contradiction and the sorrow and the doubts that we find within us, we know that things often feel and seem dark. Is there any way through this darkness? Is there anyone to save us? Is there anyone who can reach into our darkness? These are the kind of questions that are very, very old, at least 3,000 years old when Isaiah was prophesying and Israel was asking the same questions. In the first 39 chapters, almost 40 chapters of this book, Isaiah has already unpacked why Israel feels like it's in darkness. The people of God were full of idolatry. They were full of sin. Their societies and communities were rife with injustice. And because of all of this, God's judgment was coming through the Babylonians. The Babylonian army was going to sweep through Israel and decimate them and the land. Obviously, the consequence of this for God's people is discouragement, doubt, fear, and a sense of hopelessness. That's why we read in our passage in verse 10, people are described as walking in darkness without a sense of a way forward. But along with his judgment, beginning in chapter 40 of this book, Isaiah prophesied something else. God made other promises, promises to rescue his people, promises to save his people, to bring them out. And he promised to do so through a servant. The prophecy of Isaiah has what we usually call servant songs. They're poems. They're songs of the servant that God promised to send to save, the leader and the servant who would come to rescue his people. If you're Christians here and familiar with the Bible, you're probably most familiar with the fourth servant song in chapter 53, him who was crushed for our iniquities. Here in chapter 50, we have the third servant song in verses 4 to 9. The voice, as the Lord says in verse 10 of his servant. And the third servant song here in Isaiah 50 is the most personal and the most vivid of all of the songs that Isaiah revealed. Because the servant here, as you notice as we read, beginning in verse 4, he speaks personally in the first person. He speaks of me and of I. You could call this, if you will, the servant's soliloquy, the servant's self-statement about himself. He's describing here his inner life before Yahweh his Lord, his master, his God. He's talking about his inner life before his God as he ministers. And Isaiah here is revealing in this third song, him. He's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ who would be sent and who was sent and who's come. And what we have here in Isaiah 50 is a prophetic glimpse into the personal life and the inner internal life of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have here a personal testimony of the Lord Jesus describing himself as his father's disciple, his God's disciple. How will God reach us in darkness? With the disciple, with the disciple, with the only perfect disciple that God has ever had. The one who speaks, hears, and trusts his Father's word perfectly. And what the Holy Spirit speaks to us in his word is of the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, of his great trust. The Lord Jesus was the perfect student of the word of God who spoke and heard and trusted and obeyed his Father's word. And here, the Holy Spirit sets up the Lord Jesus Christ for us as our Savior and as our champion, and also our pattern of life, how we are called to live if we are His disciples and we belong to Him. We're going to listen in on verses 4 through 9 here as the perfect disciple speaks of himself. We'll notice in verse 4, the servant speaks the word of his father. In verses 5 and 6, he obeys his father's word. In 7 and 9, he trusts the Father's word. And then we'll consider in verses 10 and 11, the servant is the living word. Well, let's look at verse 4 together. The servant speaks the word. 
he says that God, the Lord Yahweh, has given him a tongue. The servant has come to teach. He's come to preach. You remember Capernaum early in his ministry pled for the Lord Jesus to stay with them because he'd healed so many people. And in Luke chapter 4, the Lord Jesus says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of, to other villages as well because I was sent for this purpose, not to heal, but to preach, to teach, and to reveal his Father's word. Jesus was sent to preach, but notice specifically in verse 4, to preach to sustain with the word him who is weary. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It is not the well who are in need of a physician, but those who are sick. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The servant was sent for sinners. He was sent for the sick. He was sent for the burden and the weary to sustain them, to comfort them with his word. And all his words were perfect for this purpose. You think of the astounding, holy integrity of Jesus' mouth, and it's breathtaking. He never flattered. When his closest disciple Peter had his mind set on the things of man, Jesus rebuked him and called him Satan. Get behind me, Satan. He never flattered. Nor was he unnecessarily hostile, even with those who were arrogant and self-righteous. You remember the rich young ruler who came up to Jesus and had the audacity to declare that he had kept all of God's commandments from his youth? And Mark records for us in Mark chapter 10 that Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, you lack one thing, sell all your things and come and follow me, revealing his covetousness. There's a sanctified sincerity in all of Jesus' words. All of them fit to sustain those with their various burdens. He said what he meant always, and he always said what was needed for the burden of the opportunity. James, in the book of James, confronts us in chapter 3 that no human being has tamed the tongue. Well, one has. The Lord Jesus Christ tamed the tongue perfectly. He was taught he had the tongue of those who were taught. Where did he get his tongue? Well, it came first through his ears. Notice in verse 4, he uses that phrase at the beginning and the end. He has the tongue of those who are taught, and he hears as those who are taught. Now, that phrase, those who are taught, is translated elsewhere. It's the Hebrew phrase just for disciple, for student, for learner. But notice it's plural, those who are taught. Why is it plural? He's emphasizing that he, as his father's servant, is submitted to the common course of training, the normal and ordinary way that the father and the Lord trains his people. Do not think that the Lord Jesus came pre-programmed with the obedience and faith of a 30-year-old while he was lying in the manger. Oh, he was an infant. He was a baby. He grew. He was a man, not a robot. He grew in wisdom and in stature. He was discipled without sin, trained without any taint of sin. And that's the emphasis here. The servant was trained in the normal, ordinary way that God trains his people by his word. Notice his testimony in the middle of verse 4. Morning by morning, he awakens daily continually the father awakened and moved him to to listen to hear he awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught he heard he sought his father's word daily patiently gradually hearing and listening bent in a humble teachable frame constantly before his father's word why does his tongue sustain the weary because his ear is bent to his father's word. He knows his father's word inside and out. 
in the wilderness, hungry and tired, the Lord Jesus repelled Satan himself with Deuteronomy. Could you repel the devil with Deuteronomy? He silences Satan with Deuteronomy. He declares over and over again in his ministry, it is written with resolve. He could say in the Sermon on the Mount, but I say to you and resolve disputed questions with complete authority, giving the authoritative interpretation of the word. After his resurrection, he walked on the road to Emmaus with two disciples. And Luke tells us in Luke 24, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He walked on the road and explained the entire Old Testament and how it points to him. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus' heart overflowed with the word of his Father so he could speak to sustain the weary and he could teach because he was filled with the word. Servant spoke the word of God. Notice also in verses 5 and 6. Secondly, the servant obeyed that word. He obeys the word. In ancient Israel, when a servant wanted to stay with his master and not be freed from his indentured bondage, the law said in Exodus 21 that he was to be taken to the doorframe of the master's house and a hole was to be born into his ear. It's ear piercing against the doorframe. And that hole punched in his ear was a reminder that he loved his master and that he was forever belonging to him, a slave forever. Look at verse 5. The Lord Yahweh has opened my ear. He's pierced my ear. I'm forever and fully belonging to my master. I'm his forever servant. And notice there's not an ounce of hesitation here. He says in verse 5, I was not rebellious. I turn not backward. Jesus would say, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. What sustains me, what gives me life, what gives me joy is doing what my master sent me to do. Doing my father's will without any hesitation. And so we see in verse 6, he willingly gave his back to those who strike. He gave himself to the flogging of a criminal. Willingly. Willingly. He gives himself to the angry mob who pull out the beard of his cheeks and who spit and deride him. And without complaint, without self-pity, willingly, willingly, he gives himself to the consequences of his discipleship. He gives himself to the consequences of obedience. When you speak God's word and obey God's word, in a world that hates God, the consequences of obedience are suffering every time. And willingly, perfectly, without hesitation, the servant gave himself to the consequences of obedience, considering that obedience more important than anything that would ever happen to him. He willingly offered himself to obey through suffering, The book of Hebrews comments on this in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 and 8, one of the most astounding passages you'll find in the Bible that open your mind to meditate on the path that the Lord Jesus trod to win our salvation. And it says that he learned obedience through what he suffered. He learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, He became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. It's Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. He learned obedience through what he suffered and being made perfect. As Jesus willingly gave himself to obey his Father, it led to increasingly difficult suffering. Difficult suffering calls for increasingly difficult obedience. And he met it. He met it every time. As the difficulty increased, as the suffering increased, he met it with obedience. He met it with obedience until he was made perfect. And be very careful. That's not perfect from imperfection to perfection. 
He was perfect at every stage of his maturity. But that's perfection from greater to greater to greater to greater degrees of perfection, greater degrees of obedience, more mature, more complete, more perfect, until he became the perfect Savior. He took the form of the servant and obeyed his father. He became obedient to the point of death, and then he became obedient to the cross, all the way perfect. And the Lord Jesus' cry in that garden of Gethsemane, his crying out as he had the cross on the cusp to the next day, his cry for the Father to remove his cup emphasizes his obedience, doesn't detract from it. It emphasizes it. The perfect servant of God is the only man who's not deserved to die, who had no sin. And so it is perfectly natural that he would recoil from taking on death. In fact, if he hadn't recoiled, it would be unnatural because he is holy. And yet, what was his final prayer? Not what I will, but what you will. And it seals his obedience to the nth degree, sealing his perfection. Nothing deterred him from obeying his father's word. Nothing. Not mockery, not disgrace, not even undeserved, excruciating, torturous death. Nothing deterred him from obeying his father's word. The Lord Jesus strove against temptation and sin to the point of shedding blood. And when it came to obedience or shedding blood, he picked obedience and shed his blood. All the way. Perfect obedience. What strength carried this servant? How was he sustained? That's what we see next in verses 7 through 9. And it's the word. The word of his father. The servant trusts the word. The servant trusted the word. At the end of verse 6, we're almost tempted to be lost in pity at the servant of the Lord being given over to such shameful treatment. But notice in verse 7, he interjects his confidence. But the Lord Yahweh helps me, just so we know. And notice the contrast from disgraced in verse 7 and disgrace in verse 6. I gave myself over in verse 6 to public disgrace, but don't think, verse 7, that means I've been disgraced. I have not. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. The response of even angry mobs did not define his identity or his purpose. His sense of honor and shame before his God was before him and God alone. So even though he was disgraced publicly, he was not disgraced internally. And he knew the suffering that was coming. He says in verse 7, I, I set my face like a flint. That's the comment that Luke makes in Luke 9.51. He set his face to Jerusalem early in his ministry, walking to the cross. He confidently marched in obedience to his death. And how he did it, he says twice here. Verse 7, the Lord Yahweh helps me. Verse 9, the Lord Yahweh helps me. Now we're tempted to ask, what help? <laughs> You're getting handed over to an angry mob, a cruel injustice. Look at the end of verse 7 and the first line of verse 8. Here is his help. I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Do you see that? I know. How does he know that? He knows his father's word. Not just the commands that he would obey and follow, but the promises. Promises like Psalm 16. You will not abandon my whole soul to Hades or my soul to Sheol. You will not abandon your servant. Or Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. He knew his father's promises. The father's promises for this servant. He knew, end of verse 7, I shall not be put to shame. I may be publicly disgraced now, but I will never finally be put to shame. Because the Lord has promised me. 
I am a servant. And the one who promised, who vindicates, verse 8, he is near. He's near me. Beloved, mark this. The Lord Jesus walked by faith, not by sight. He lived in faith, not in sight. There was nothing external, observable for the Lord Jesus to trust. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was praying, he had only a few disciples, and they were sleeping. When he is finally arrested for trial, the Lord had no disciples. They were running. And as he was dying on the cross, the Lord Jesus only had one disciple, and that was a criminal who was dying along with him. There was nothing observable for him to look at no legacy or fruit immediately for him to see that would vindicate his obedience. There was no observable success to his ministry as he's dying. I know I shall not be put to shame. His faith was on his father's word. Even on that cry of dereliction, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's right out of God's word. That's Psalm 22, verse 1. David's cry for God's abandonment under the justice of the cross. But that's not the only thing Psalm 22 says. Jesus pulls from a psalm that ends later with this. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. Even in the cry of dereliction, even in the moment of suffering his father's judgment, the Lord Jesus quotes a psalm that ends with confidence, that ends with vindication, that he knows it's coming. Jesus dies with no visible sight of victory in front of him, but with full confidence that victory is his because of faith in his father's word and what he knew. And notice in verse 8, his confidence is in his future vindication. He who vindicates me is near. To vindicate means to, to declare just. It's the same word group around we get the word justify. It means to declare just, to be affirmed as guiltless, regardless of what others say, to be vindicated as righteous. And notice that arms him with boldness. Look at this boldness here in verse 8. He's using court language. Who's going to contend with me? Let us stand up together. He puts himself in the witness stand where he did stand in trial, and he's, he's, he's calling people to come and join him to that bar. Go ahead. Let's argue about this. Let's contend. Who is my adversary? Let him, let him come near to me. Come to the stand. I'm ready. I'm ready to stand in trial. And notice even in verse 9, as he's standing there. Behold, Lord Yahweh helps me. Who will declare me guilty? He now turns, as it were, to the judge's seat. And who is it that's going to declare me guilty? His confidence in his father's word. And when he was brought to trial, there were no accusations of guilt that could stick. The only charge that stuck to the Lord Jesus in that kangaroo court was that he claimed to be the Christ, the Son of God. And which he said, yeah, that's true, because I am. And while the authorities condemned him to death, with all the terrifying power of his world and his generation, with all their lethal power, by faith, the Lord Jesus knew who they were. Look at the end of verse 9. Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Unlike the God who vindicates him and who is near, all the people who are judging him will pass away. He pulls this likely right out of Psalm 102. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. 
but your years have no end. He's standing there in confidence in his father's word, even as he's facing death by the judgments of a court of this world. He stands there and he recognizes who everyone who judges him is, a temporary garment passing away. He's not terrified by the world's judgments. He trusts the judge, his father, whose judgments supersede death and who last forever because they're written in his word. And so he trusts him. And three days after he was condemned to death and he died, he was vindicated. The Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 1, he was declared to be the Son of God by the Spirit of holiness through the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection declares him to be who he said he was. The whole way, vindicated, completely raised from the dead, vindicated as the perfect servant, as perfectly righteous. He was who he said he was, and he is still now, raised from the dead. And that brings us to the conclusion of this song in verses 10 and 11. The servant is the living word. The living word. The servant's soliloquy ends in verse 9 with him facing suffering with confidence, with undeterred determination. And here in verse 10, now the Lord speaks up, Yahweh speaks up, and he helps us draw the lines here on what we're supposed to get out of his servant's soliloquy, out of his statements. What are we to get from this perfect disciple for us who walk in darkness? Notice foremost in verse 10, the first two lines, that fearing the Lord and obeying the voice of his servant are parallel. They're the same. This disciple receives the same reverence as his Lord. Yet he's in the flesh, he is a man, yet he is to be feared like God. To fear the Lord is to obey the voice of his servants. My sheep hear my voice and they know me, and they follow me. To hear his voice is to hear the word of God. To fear God is to hear his voice. He is God speaking. Is it, do you see it, it drawing out of these two lines? Is it any wonder he's called by John the word? He's God's word. He's the ultimate revelation of God to us. God with us is God's ultimate and final revelation. The Son of God is the perfect disciple, the Savior, God's Word. And the servant obeyed to death, to death on a cross. He died a death he didn't deserve in our place, in the place of sinners, so that our judgment would be his, and notice this, verse 8, his vindication would be ours that all those who trust in Jesus, all those who unite to him by faith, his vindication as perfectly righteous is theirs. It's ours. It's yours if you trust him. His declaration of righteous is all our righteousness. If you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, his great vindication is our justification that the perfect son of God has come lived a life vicariously for us and laid it down on the cross that that judgment he didn't deserve would be done in our place and the righteousness we don't deserve would be ours by faith. If that vindication isn't yours, trust him, go to him, lean on him and be vindicated before God, righteous before God, because of Jesus, not us. His vindication as the perfect servant is belongs to all who trust him. And you see here now as we're walking through, we get at the end of verse 10 where this is going. Where do we find light in darkness? Where do you find light in our darkness? You find it in the word, the light of salvation. The word became flesh who spoke the word of his father and calls us to hear the word. 
We cannot separate following the Savior from listening to the Scripture. The word incarnated and the word inscripturated are inseparable. We have the Bible and we have the Lord Jesus, or we have neither. You can't have one without the other. We have both as God speaks to us, speaking in his word, has spoken to us in the word who's given to us more word, and we live our lives and find light in darkness from the word, from God's speech, trusting him and seeing God's word to us. And if we trust in this servant, if we seek Jesus and we see him, he is the the perfect disciple. He saves us in himself and he also saves us to be like himself, to be like him, to live in him. Remember back in verse four, those who are taught, he is the pattern of those who are taught. He is the disciple. For us to obey his voice, we are to look at the end of verse 10, trust in the name of Yahweh and rely on his God. Well, who walked in darkness and trusted in the name of Yahweh and relied on his God? Who did it perfectly? The servant did it. Jesus did it. We are being called to live the life that he lived. Beloved, Jesus not only saves us to life, he saves us into a life. He saves us into a way of living. He calls us into a pattern of discipleship a pattern of life that he has perfectly lived before us. It's the way that disciples are supposed to live. It's the way we're called to live. That means we must glance back at verses four through nine and and see the servant's testimony. Well, well Well, that's our calling. This is how we're called to live. This is, he set out for us perfect humanity before his father that we would follow in his footsteps and be like him by his grace and the power of his spirit. Let's just go back to verse four and meditate for a moment on verse four. The Lord Yahweh has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with the word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. Just think about that applied to you. Think about our speech as disciples. There's a disciple's tongue. What if we measured our growth spiritually, not by the content of our mind, but the content of our our mouths, what comes off our, our tongues? What if we tested our doctrinal acumen and our ability and maturity by whether or not we can sustain the weary with a word? Many of us would no longer take pride in our maturity, would we? Or our advancements. If truth be told, some of us have very, very unguarded mouths and we toss words out like the wind, careless to their effects. And if we were honest at times, the weary avoid us and don't come to us. Others of us, however, have mouths, but they're shut. And we have yet to see the need for our words to sustain those around us, our brothers and sisters, and those outside of us to build up and to give strength, to to stir up one another to love and good works, and to speak the wonderful name of Jesus and his hope-giving gospel. Whatever the case, and for most of us, probably a little bit of both, our prayer is, give me a disciple's tongue, the tongue of those who are taught, that I might know how to sustain the weary with a word. And that brings us, of course, just as it did him in verse 4, to our hearing as disciples. The tongue we see here begins with the ears. Morning by morning, what awakens your ears? The day's demands? Your phone's notifications? Or the voice of your God and his servant? To what do you incline your ear? What is the focus of your your meditation in your mind? 
Beloved, our Lord Jesus spent 30 years to prepare for three. He took 30 years of hearing his Father's word to prepare for three years of teaching it. Think about that and have it reset your expectations. 30 years to prepare for three. Really, when we think about that, we're confronted with the reality of time. Time and patience. Too often we think of discipleship and change and growth in the church as Christians is like dynamite. Waiting for God to drop that stick of dynamite and blow us open. That's why often as Christians we'll chase conferences and books and, and speakers. We're looking for techniques. We're looking for that stick of dynamite. And that's often why we grow impatient with ourselves, impatient with our friends and with our church because we wanted God to just blow it up now. But change and growth and discipleship is far less like dynamite, and it's far more like erosion, like water. It's the constant force, like, like a river. If you go stand at a mountain river, and you stare at a rock, and you watch it flow over that rock, and it, it looks like nothing. I mean, you're, I'm not seeing nothing happen. It's just water flowing over that rock. But given enough time, Slowly, that rock, that rock is shaped by the contour of that river. And it's shaped by the flow of that water. And that is discipleship. You submerge your rocky heart under the flow of the living water of the Word of God. And yes, any one moment, any one sermon, any one quiet time, any one Bible study, it seems like nothing's happening. But you do that for 30 years, and that rock starts looking like that water. And his saints start looking like their savior. And we grow and we change. You become a man or a woman of God by walking that path, hearing his word day by day by day by day. There's no technique. There's no silver bullet. There's no microwave. There's just time and discipline and commitment and prayer and word daily, constantly. Awaken my ear. Awaken my ear to hear as those who are taught. And if we're tempted to despise that, we see here in this chapter a great warning and reminder. This is how God trained his son. God trained his son with the word and prayer, and it sustained him to the point of shedding his blood on the cross. If you are called Christian, and you are, to strive against sin to the point of shedding your blood, the word of God and prayer will sustain you to even that. The word will sustain us. We don't need any other way of discipleship. We don't need any other techniques, any other programs. We need ears that hear the word of our God to follow his course, the constant, continual giving our life in patience to the Word of God. Now, of course, today, this morning, we added new brothers into office in our congregation. And so it's a fitting to address that and point a couple things out here too, especially for those of us who serve as elders and pastors and those of us who also serve as deacons. And the point we want to especially remember is that the chief shepherd, our senior pastor, the Lord Jesus Christ, was a perfect disciple. That before we are ever office bearers or elders or deacons or leaders, we are disciples always. We are that first and foremost. Earlier in ministry, I had a list of characteristics to look for and in others that may have leadership potential to see in myself as goal. And I've, I've now I've whittled it down to three things. You know what they are? Humility, humility, humility. Humility defined by Isaiah in Isaiah 66. Those who are humble and contrite in heart and tremble at his word. Those who hunger for his word. I remembered the book that my pastor read with me early on looking at ministry, spiritual leadership by J. Oswald Sanders. 
My favorite statement in that book, the young man of leadership caliber will work while others waste time. He will study while others sleep. He will pray while others play. There is no place for slovenly habits in word or thought or deed or dress. He's hungry for the word of God, and that's what he does. Brothers, if we are called to serve the church and we are given public visibility in that, we are called first and foremost to humble ourselves under the word of God. And that is our calling and is so true. We study while they're sleeping. We're praying while they're playing. We are committing ourselves in word and deed to the word of God, humbling ourselves under it, asking God to awaken us, our ears to him daily, listening to him that we might have tongues that sustain the weary. And that's another important reminder for us who serve and teach and shepherd that our tongue is given us to teach in verse 4, to know how to sustain with the word the weary. This is our calling to the sinful, the sick, the burdened. It is not to contend endlessly with the arrogant. It's not to g- gain platforms for ourselves and do battle with our hobby horses, we are to set out a light for the weary in the darkness, to set out a light to them to Christ. In the darkness, we look to Christ and his word. And finally, in verse 11, we end with a warning. A warning that if we look anywhere else, if we, verse 11, walk by the light of your fire and the torches that you have kindled. He uses this imagery in verse 11 of those who equip yourselves with burning torches, and that image means to gird yourself. That is to even take a torch and to tie it on your waistband so you can work with both your hands in the darkness, which sounds completely insane to me, but apparently you could pull it off a few thousand years ago. The idea was to gird themselves with the light so they could work while it's dark, and the image here is an image of desperation of energy and effort, of people in the darkness who look not to the Lord and his servants, but who equip themselves, emphasis on themselves, with their own fires, the torches you have kindled, the lights of their own making. Do you see what he's saying here? Sometimes we think that relativism, post-modernity, people creating their own truth, that that's new. <laughs> Isaiah was dealing with it 3,000 years ago because that's always been the only two options on this earth, following the word of God or making up something else for yourself. It's always only ever been those two options. And this is the warning he then lays out. Open yourself to the Lord. Trust him. Obey the voice of his servants. Or light your own fire. But know this. You can walk by the light of your fire. You may be able to put together a pretty good life with your own two hands and your light. Middle class, respectable, people like you. You can do a lot of work with two hands and a torch strapped to your waist. Go ahead, walk by that light. But in the end, end of verse 11, this promise from God himself. You have this from my hand you will lie down in torment, in grief or pain that never ends. You see the warning here from God? Everyone in this life, on this cursed earth, walks in darkness. That's God's design to remind us of the judgment that our sin has unfolded on this world. But those who turn to him and to his son, they find light. They have a way forward. There is hope and confidence. For those who turn away and make their own lights, the grief and the pain and the darkness of this world after death goes on forever. And judgment is there is no light. There is no hope. There is unending torment under the justice of God for rejecting him and his servant. Eternal judgment is that grief of unending sin, eternal hopelessness. And he lays that out for us to underscore what has been stated so beautifully and clearly for us. There's one hope. There's only one to look to in darkness. There's only one who is coming and has come 
to save us. The Lord Jesus Christ. The only perfect disciple. And he's all we need. He is all we need in the darkness. Let's pray. Father, we pray as disciples of your Son to be made disciples and commit ourselves again to the course of your Word and the way of your Son. Father, we pray that you would free us from every cheap substitute, from every other false fire, and commit us heart and mind and soul to your Son and your Word and the long, long life of obedience before him, trusting you to shape us and mold us as you did your own son, and that even through suffering we would learn obedience and we would learn to glorify you always. And Father, again we pray for all of us who have taken the mantle, even this day, of pastor or deacon in our church, that we would lead as disciples first, who walk after your son, submit ourselves to him, and then turn around to sustain our brothers and sisters with your word. Give us help, Father, and we pray be glorified as you shape and fashion your servants to do your will.